Where do you go when you want to catch multiple lines of history all at one time? A place that um, has so many stories to tell that you have to go there time and time again in order to get the full story. Well, today I'm out at such a place called Berkeley Plantation. And I've been invited out here as a guest uh, to come out here and tell some of the stories. We're going to focus a little bit more on the Civil War aspect of it, but this place has a lot to offer. It's one of those places that you can't just visit once. Many times when I come out here, the places like this plantation house and uh, other areas, I uh, kind of go fly the seat of my pants and uh, do a little bit of studying prior to, to try to get a, a story out of the whole thing. But sometimes I actually get, uh, I get some help. I get some people that know what they're talking about. They have that, uh, that long, standing knowledge of this place and today i have a person with me that's going to help me out with this video Her name is tammy six generations of the benjamin harrison family lived here at berkeley mainly growing tobacco but they also started a shipyard here on the grounds, and the shipyard here at Berkeley was the first that was commercially successful in North America, and so would build some of the warships that were used during the American Revolution. Out of the Harrison family, you would have a signer of the Declaration of Independence, that's Benjamin Harrison V, and then his grandson, born here, his son, the youngest son, William Henry Harrison, would end up being the ninth president of the United States. So a lot of history associated with the Benjamin Harrison family. Unfortunately, though, they would lose Berkeley to bankruptcy um, in 1842. And Benjamin Harrison VII actually borrowed money from the Bank of New York. Now, $28,000 doesn't sound like a lot to us today, but that's about $2 million in today's dollars. And so he then died a few months later, and his son, Benjamin Harrison VIII, was forced into bankruptcy because the bank called that loan. So the Harrisons left here in 1842, and it was after they left that the plantation was divided. It had originally been 8,000 acres, so three miles of waterfront, which we still control today but 8,000 acres inland. You'll actually find Harrison's Mill on Edgewood Plantation because that part was sold off. From the time of just before the Civil War, we were about a 1,400 acre plantation and that would continue into the 20th century. Today, we're down to about 1,100 with a portion being sold off in the 1940s to build a home that's now called Kimmages. Okay. So for me, it's really about the Harrison family, the life of Benjamin Harrison V, the interest of the character that he was. He truly was a character. There is a picture that was taken of him. He served in the Continental Congress, was the um, very in favor of the Declaration of Independence, was a big part of what led to that passing. And there's a picture of him once John Hancock was selected as the secretary. He was so happy about it that he literally picked him up and carried him into the chair <laughs> at the front to take over the uh, Continental Congress. So that just gives you a picture of who Benjamin Harrison V is. He was uh, six foot four, 300 pounds, gregarious, did not take himself seriously. And uh, one of the other funny stories about Benjamin V is at the, at the signing of the declaration, he said to Elbridge Gary, that's the a representative from Massachusetts, a small, slight man. He said to him, 
I shall have a great advantage over you, Mr. Gary, when we're all hung for what we're doing today. For by the weight of my body, I shall die but in a few minutes, but at the lightness of yours, you shall dance in the air for two or three hours. So it really gave you a picture of him. He was a character. Yeah. He actually took over the plantation in 1745 at the age of 19. On a July evening here in 1745, July 12th, his father was in the second floor bedroom, which you can't see yet, of the mansion with his daughter, Hannah, holding her hand, closing the plantation shutters for a storm coming down the river. And he was struck by lightning wow. and died. His, his daughter died instantly. He died about three hours later. And then the, his mother, Ann Carter Harrison, actually took to her bed, refused to eat or drink, and she died of a broken heart 30 days after her husband. So Benjamin V takes over at 19 and really successfully, you know, enhanced the family's fortune and what they did and um, was very well known um, during that time, was a very famous part of our, our founding in the revolutionary period. the Civil War becomes a very poignant picture of what can happen to an individual family. Because, of course, the Harrisons, though they left here in 1842, the direct descendants of Benjamin, the Benjamin Harrisons settled in Northern Virginia, and during the, the Civil War would have been Confederates. They would have supported the, the South, they owned slaves, etc. William Henry Harrison, though, like probably the most famous or second most famous of the of the Harrisons who lived here, would live the most of his life out in the Northwest Territories. He left here at 18, would um, serve in the War of 1812, and then his grandson was a Brigadier General in the Union Army. So that close, the family is connected and on opposite sides of that. I, one okay. of the stories I can tell that's a part of the backdrop of our story here Benjamin Harrison V was a signer of the Declaration, but he did not vote in favor of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And his reasoning was like many people, it didn't have a Bill of Rights, and that was a big issue. But one of his main objections was that the slave trade was going to continue for 20 years after the passage of the Constitution. Now that may sound like he didn't agree with slavery, and that's not the truth. Right. Reality was the Industrial Revolution had led to advancements in technology that reduced the need for slaves. Okay. Now they were a part of his property. Property. They were a part of his wealth. And with the continuing um, slave trade bringing more Africans here, not only was it wrong in our own modern view, he saw it as a economic a disadvantage for him because it diluted the value of his property. So he did not sign a vote in favor of the Constitution. the Seven Days Battle and McClellan being pushed back by the Confederates unable to uh, capture Richmond, he decided to change his base per his side of the story and sent his troops south toward the James River. He wanted to establish a base here along the James River. And so they headed this way, fought a big battle just about 12 miles from here at Malvern Hill in Henrico County. And then he sent advanced troops to kind of scope out and settle. They knew Harrison's was abandoned. The owner went into the Confederate Army. Most of, the, most of the plantations around here were abandoned because the war was being fought right around here. And so the advance troops arrived late June. They fought the Battle of Malvern Hill and then the mass of the army starts heading this way. And it started to rain as they headed out and it became a torrential downpour as they made their way through fields of corn and wheat, which had been in full bloom by that point and unfortunately were destroyed as part of that march. Not just all the, the bringing of equipment and ammunition, but the soldiers foraged and, and kept the wheat and the corn and that type of thing. And this one of the cool stories from that march, the mud was so bad with all that heavy equipment coming through it and the water and the torrential rain, there's a story of a mule that literally 
collapsed down to his ears <laughs> in the mud. <laughs> wow. Had to be rescued from the mud pit. And so they get here July 1st. The, most of the army came um, relieved to get here, but still raining. They would actually had lost a bunch of equipment over that course of that peninsula campaign. Uniforms, etc., were in disrepair. And they arrive here and have to, they don't even have tents. They're trying to set up these just cloth over bushes using the wheat sheaves that they've just taken as beds. So it was a pretty demoralizing and difficult time. And then once they got encamped and settled, things got a little better. Um, those supply ships start bringing in new tents. They all need a new uniforms, thanks to the lice that they had picked up along the last few days. And they settled the encampment. Now, right after they settled here on July 2nd, the encampment came under fire. Jeb Stewart had actually captured the high ground about four miles from here on Evelynton Heights. And he had one howitzer that started firing on Harrison's Landing. So they had to start almost right away fighting again. They engaged Stewart and his howitzer and it ran out of ammunition. And so they took off because they had been expecting Stonewall Jackson who was on his way here. They thought he would reinforce them. And if they had captured the high ground, it really could have changed the whole direction of the war, but yeah. it, they didn't. And so the Union was able to establish the position. Their guard was from Herring Creek, which is the creek up as you come into the plantation, over to Kimmage's Creek, which is um, a few miles down the road here. And so they kind of reinforced that boundary, held the high ground, and Jackson tried to incur into it and establish that high ground again and was not able to do that. So it really did make a difference on what happened here. Um, I'm going to read a letter, if you will, of a, this is William Frederick Keeler, who was stationed on the monitor right out here in front of Harrison's Landing. And he wrote a letter to his sister, describing to her as he walked up from the river to the house, what he saw along the way. So let's head that way and I'll read the letter. Dated on the monitor, January, J July 14th, 1862, off Harrison's Landing. Dear Anna, it seems a long, long time since I wrote to you, and to you, I suppose, it seems longer still. I have, in the meantime, sent home a couple of little notes to you to let you know that I was still in existence and had not forgotten the old folks at home, nor the young ones, either. What has been wanting in letters I have endeavored to make good in papers, of which I have sent quite a number, some of them pictorials, to Eddie. I continue to receive your letters regularly and read them, as you may well suppose, with the greatest satisfaction. If this sweltering weather continues, it will curtail letter writing, as you will find, for our staterooms are nearly as bad as the Black Hole of Calcutta, and I find a letter is written at the cost of a large amount of perspiration. The mental exertion is nothing, but this is not to the cost of a large, not to the point. You want the news, and as perhaps it would come the best in the form of connective narrative, as far as concerns myself. We will go back to my proposal. Walk through the camp on Sunday the 6th. It is Sunday to be sure, but there is no church, and the time would be no better spent if we remained on board. If you desire to accompany me, just step into the captain's gig. Take a seat on the cushions and shove off men. We're off for the camp. See what forced out fellows we have to pull the oars. They're Norwegians, each one the model of a sailor. We will land here at the end of this long dock. Harrison's Landing, it is called. How the steamboats and smaller vessels cluster about it. Most of the steamboats are to be hospitals for the sick and wounded, and, and the somewhat antiquated females you see about their decks are the Florence Nightingales that are to be. After seeing the sights, I think you will agree with me that it is no place for a modest female, a lady. Now we're at the end of the dock. You see the ground slopes gently upward for some distance till you reach the house, which is approached by what has been a finely graveled walk through clumps of trees and a beautiful lawn. But now how different. These portions of the grounds are attached to the hospital department and are covered with tents in which those not severely sick. Look into the tents as we pass along towards the house. 
Be careful where you step, for as yet no sanitary regulations are enforced in the camp. Here are three or four poor fellows in the tent, pale, that is, pale as their leather-like skin can be pale, cheeks fallen in and eyes sunken. They have to be a pitiful tale to tell of their privations and sufferings during the six days retreat. Too sick to fight, too well to be left behind, they straggled along, now in the hands of the enemy, now with our own forces. Here is one with his head bandaged up, one with his arm in a sling, another hobbling along with a rudely constructed crutch. Each has a tale to tell of horror and of blood, for they were among the fighting men. See lying on the ground in the shade of that ragged blanket stretched on the tops of a few small bushes, that boy, but little larger than our Henry. He tells you he was a drummer boy and was ridden down by a charge of cavalry breaking his ribs. His thin pale face shows how he suffers. Still, he talks cheerfully and points with pride to the two or three bullet holes that decorate his ragged clothes. There is one lying on an old bit of cloth in the partial shade of that bush. How miserably he looks. He is from Michigan, where he has a wife and children, whom he says he never expects to see again, as he knows he must die. What must be his feelings as he lies there alone and unattended, but his only lost my place. But is only he is only a single case out of thousands. From this tent on the right, they are bringing out the corpse of one whose fighting days are o'er. Tent after tent, as we pass them, are filled with their careworn faces, weak, sickly frames, and bandaged limbs. Many are strewn around in the shade of the bushes and trees which line our path. All seem glad to rest, to rest in the glad consciousness of safety and security to which they have so long a time been strangers. Here we are at the house, which you see is a large two-story brick one with a wide hall running through in the middle. Our Signal Corps have added two rudely constructed stages on the ridge of the roof for the purpose of signaling at a distance. The building bears evident marks of age, the bricks of which it is constructed having been brought from England. It also has an additional interest from having been the birthplace of President Harrison. our walk towards the front. The ground is covered with old rags and tattered garments, here a broken sword, there a bayonet, there a cartridge box, all half-trodden into the stiffening clay, which lies hardening in deep ruts and ridges as it, it has been left by the heavy wheels of artillery and baggage wagons. Here in this mud hole is the wreck of an ammunition wagon. The box is still full and half buried in the stiff clay from, bro uh, from every passing horse. There is a dead mule, and near it a horse, and a little further on the entrails of cattle killed for food. And here we pass more and still more, all lying putrefying on the ground, mingling their odors with other unbearable smells, which might naturally be supposed to arise from a newly made camp where proper sanitary regulations are not yet enforced. Here we meet a long line of soldiers, a regiment, coming into camp with their guns slung on their backs, some with axes on their shoulders, others with spades and shovels. They have been at work through the day on the defenses in front. Now we are passing by a large body of cavalry bound on picket duty. This is an ambulance coming in with sick and wounded men. On the other side of this large cleared field across which soldiers are passing and reset passing in all directions is General Meager's brigade. The men look tough and hardy as we pass through them, and their tents occupy a large piece of ground. This large collection of tents and men we are now passing through is General McCall's, who is reported to be a prisoner. The men are variously occupied, cooking, marching, mending, reading, sleeping, etc. These large guns passing us are a portion of McClellan's heavy siege artillery and are on their way to the front to be placed in position. 
See what a long train of heavy baggage wagons, each drawn by six mules. We must now be nearly three miles from where we landed, so they are way across, up toward Herring Creek. That's about three miles <clears throat> where we landed. It must be nearing the defenses in front of the left wing. Yes, here we are. This long wooden wall, breast high, looking like the continuous wall of a log house, is a portion of the entrenchments. A ditch is dug some little distance in front of this wooden wall, the earth from it being thrown up against the logs. Spaces are left at short intervals, intervals from which peer out field pieces and howitzers charged for the foe. A sentry is at each gun. The remainder of the company lying around in the shade, but ready for duty on the first notice from our pickets. Let's talk a while about this sentry who gives us the military salute as we approach. His story savors of romance. Still, we cannot doubt its truth when he tells us of the fatigues and hardships of six days of constant fighting and marching, and how his face lights up when he tells how his gun mowed down whole columns of the enemy as they charged desperately upon his piece. How proud he is of the ball hole through his cap and another through his pants, and here comes his comrade to exhibit his canteen, smashed by the fragment of a shell. You cannot doubt their story, strange though it may seem. There is too much earnestness in their manner. They tell us we can go a little further on where we will find pickets we cannot pass without the countersign, which not having, we will retrace our steps toward the starting point. It really puts you right back He's described it so well, from the sight to the smells to the sounds, that you can actually picture it. You know, on my tour, I try to create a picture, um, not of all the different periods of history, but particularly for the Civil War, because it was such an expensive number one time. A month and a half is a long time for an army to be encamped. And of course, it was a, a kind of a dividing point from the beginning stages of the war into the next phase of the war. Right. And you can call it a change of base as McClellan did, or you can call it a retreat, which is probably the more likely answer. But just to picture, I'm here every week seeing, walking these grounds, to me it truly is hallowed ground because of what happened here. And I love being able to see the picture that's created from these original sources that we continue to gather. One of my, the first year I worked here back in 2019, I was doing my tour and we were in the, the room where I talk about William Henry Harrison. And one of my guests stopped me and said, I'm sorry to interrupt, but can I read you a letter that I have? And it was from his great grandfather. And it literally did the same thing. It talked about him coming into the mansion and portraying what he saw room by room. And it was just a really unique experience. And again, it allowed us to gather one more piece of the actual primary source history of Berkeley Plantation. So it's right. pretty amazing. Absolutely. <laughs> It has been challenging for us to have enough traffic through here to support the ongoing plantation. This is not a government funded place. This is right. a privately owned property. Um, and it's, there are other parts to it. It's not just the historic property. We are a working farm of about 500 acres. But the main the thing that keeps us going is the tours we give here at Berkeley. So it has been challenging. Um, and today now we work one tour guide and I'm usually working in the gift shop because I've been here for a while, I've been doing tours for a long time. So I enjoy interacting with folks on a more casual basis, talking to them. That's where I get to tell a lot of the stories that I don't get to tell on my tour yeah. because as the proper historian of the plantation today, I have a lot of interest in fleshing out the bigger picture of the history. So right. I've done a lot of work, a lot of research, a lot of gathering.
Well, that actually goes back to when we first met. And one of the things that drew us together and that we, as we were learning, getting to know one another, so we both learned that we had a love of history. And when we got married back in 2000, we spent our honeymoon touring historic properties throughout the deep south in Louisiana and Mississippi and up the Mississippi. And then we drove up the Mississippi River, kind of refollowing, retracing some of the early steps. And so that's, I'm a history major. He's not, but he has always been a huge uh, fan of, not fan, but interested in the Civil War. So that's his primary area. I'm really the more expert in the earlier history, the colonial and revolutionary periods. That was my um, certification and for my history degree. I really focused on that. So together we've kind of helped each other fill in those gaps. You know, he's taught me a lot more about the Civil War than I ever learned <laughs> in college. Or, and of course, working here has really kind of renewed our fascination. Here at Berkeley, you can experience every part of American history going all the way back to the founding of the settlements here back in the 1600s. Very cool. Yeah. So one of our other claims to fame is that Berkeley was the site of the first bourbon whiskey made in America. We have, a, we have a painting here and then a still. I don't think they used a still because they weren't in use, but George Thorpe, who was one of the founding members of the Berkeley Company, came here in 1620 as the second governor of the colony, and he made a drink out of corn that was said to be much better than the beer that they brought here from England. So that's a unique part of our history too. Um, I haven't talked about it yet, but Berkeley is also the birthplace of TAPS. Um, General Daniel Butterfield was encamped here on the grounds during um, McClellan's um, retreat here in 1862. And in that boring time after they've settled in and there's no attacks, they're just kind of hanging out here at Berkeley, he decided to re redo Tattoo. Tattoo was the lights out bugle call for the mm -hmm. army back then. And so he brought his bugler, Oliver Wilcox Norton, over one night and said, I'm gonna whistle a tune that I want you to make, put notes to. And so he whistled out and together with Oliver Wilcox Norton would create the notes that are now TAPS today. And so we have that. There are a lot of different stories about the birth of TAPS. You've probably read some of them, but we have the letter, a copy of the letter here that Norton wrote home to his family that describes how he and Butterfield came up with taps. And then here in this setting, that is the bugle that he actually had here at Berkeley the summer, July of 1862, and on which he would sound taps for the first time. And with all those soldiers encamped here, over 100,000 likely, there's no documented number specific, but at least 100,000. They all heard him playing taps, that haunting melody, that first night. And he talks about how the very next day, buglers from along the, around the encampment came to him and wanted the notes. And so, ta and even across the river, the Confederates would have heard the sounding of taps. And so, this is 1862, 1874, taps becomes the official lights out bugle call of the U.S. military. <music> I think the greatest thing is that it spans the years of America. I mean, it really covers the period from the early settlements you know, we have a revolutionary war here, a war battle happening here. You have one of the founding fathers living here. And then as that time goes on, you have connections into politics with the ninth and 23rd president coming from this era, this area. And then the Civil War. We've talked so much about that, and it continues on. The Knox family and their history is connected to the early founding of our country too. They owned Berkeley in the late 1800s. They're the ones that added the dormers on the windows and they're descendants of Henry Knox, the first governor of war or the first secretary of war under George Washington. And of course, then you come into the modern day and the, the Jamesons, they connect back to those periods too. Um, John who fought in the civil war was not only here during the civil war, um, 
Mac, the one who created the historic property here, visited during the encampment as a drummer boy. You know, so there's so much here that really connects with every aspect. We, and I'll give you a neat story to illustrate that. So um, Fort Greg Adams, it's just down the road here. And they train people from all over the world who work on bases in their home country. And they come for training, but one of the things they have to learn is the history of the United States. And they're, the head of that um, training program brings them here because by coming here, they get an overview of the fullness of American history. So I've, I've been treated to handling some of those tours and it's really interesting. And then one of the ones that I did, it happened to be during COVID, so it was truly a private tour. There was someone on my tour from six of the seven continents around the world. And they spoke English because of course they were training to work on American military bases, but those tours are so satisfying to share with these people who come from everywhere the history that's attached to Berkeley. So you get American history here. You can get every aspect of American history here. And that's quite a legacy in the modern age. A signer of the Declaration of Independence, a president of the United States, an entire Union Army that had just won a battle, but yet retreated. This is the location that we're at today, here at Berkeley Plantation. Well, it's not very often that I get to talk to a historian and get them on camera or have one reach out to me, really, and ask me if I would like to come out and film at their location. But I was able to here at Berkeley. Berkeley Plantation out here in Virginia, if you drive quickly, you're going to miss it. Um, there's not too many signs. There's signs for Shirley Plantation and, and other places like that. But out here at Berkeley Plantation, it's really in the middle of nowhere. Now, I've read on blogs like Johnny Banks, for example, where he talked about feeling, when you walk out here, feeling like you're in the middle of nowhere, and then you're all of a sudden reminded that you're in the modern times by a noise or uh, by the electrical plant that's across the way. This place truly is a step back in history here at Berkeley. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna find that road that we were told about earlier. I was told that there is a road out here that leads to the cemetery where a lot of the family members are buried. And the actual landing for Harrison's Landing is directly out in front of that. So now, as you can see, the land stretching out behind me here as I'm going down the rows of uh, farm fields. I'm in the actual area of where one of the wharfs would have been for Harrison's Landing. When you come out to Berkeley, um, the road or the gravel road that leads you out to the river would make you think that that's one of the wharfs, but it's not. Uh, the positions actually start over here where I'm at right now and they stretch themselves off in that direction there. That's where the actual war begins, right here. Um, Civil War soldiers would have come ashore right here where I'm at today. Those Union soldiers would have made their way up this bank off of ships 
and set up camps in the fields directly behind me. This is Harrison's Landing. All of this stretching in this direction. I'm actually standing at one of the locations where a wharf would have been built for the men to come ashore when the ships pull alongside here at the James River. It's pretty amazing to see how far out the James River stretches from this point. And you can tell there's definitely enough, enough depth to this water for a larger um, vessel to come through here and uh, more alongside of a wharf. Over here, upwards of around 140,000 Union soldiers would come ashore. They would inundate these fields and these farm fields all around. And they would set up camp and wait for orders. When the general got here, his idea was to set up this uh, almost impenetrable fortress. He wanted breastworks all around the surrounding area leading into where Berkeley was and into these fields here. But, as was pointed out before, Jeb Stewart got here first, and he was on high grounds off in that direction over there, and started lobbing shells over in this direction. Thankfully for the Union soldiers here, uh, Jeb Stewart did not bring a large force with him when he did that. And they were able to get here, set up their camps, and start putting in defense works stretched out in front of me in a uh, almost like a U-shape around this area, which is really what protected and saved them. So now you're a Union soldier, and you've been fighting the Seven Days Battles, and you've been getting your teeth kicked in, and you're tired. You don't have proper clothes on. Maybe you're, you, you're infested with fleas and ticks, and your feet are hurting you. And you get here and you think, oh, great, we're going to prop up a tent by the river, and we're going to have a nice couple of days to rest before we do anything. And that does not turn out to be the case. As soon as you get here, you're put to manual labor, digging fortifications for your protection. Elijah Hunt Rhodes would encounter George B. McClellan out here while he was going into a working party. And Elijah Hunt Rhodes would write about that in one of his letters. Elijah Hunt Rhodes recalls, This morning, all troops were put to work upon the line of forts that had been laid out. As I was going to the spring, I met General McClellan, who said, Good morning, pleasantly, and told our party that as soon as the forts were completed, we shall have rest. He later on recounts, Soldiering is not fun but duty keeps us in the ranks. Now that's one soldier out here, Elijah on Rhodes. He goes on to be an officer in this Union Army, and his story is told widely um, with a broad stroke, if you will, um, by Ken Burns in his documentary. He focuses more in on the letters and the telling of the way Elijah saw things, just like he focused in on um, the soldier from Company H. But Elijah is just one patriotic version of a soldier that's out here in these fields. There are other soldiers out here who write stories, write letters back home that talk about how they are discontented with what they're doing. They are angry with having to retreat and be out here on these banks. They are tired of sitting here in camp waiting to fight. They want to get back at it or go home. And that is what George B. McClellan's facing here. And then the president visits. President Abraham Lincoln comes out here twice. And one time, he does a review for this army that's out here. And McClellan 
tries to embarrass him. So Lincoln comes out here for a review. George B. McClellan thought it would be funny to give him a horse that was too small for him. So Lincoln's out here on a horse. It's really short, really small. Lincoln's long legs are dangling off the side. His pant legs have been pulled up on one side and his hairy leg is showing. And one of the private soldiers actually remarks in a letter back home seeing the gangly long Lincoln dangling from a tiny little horse. He does his review. Now, a review is basically a spectacle. There's no real purpose behind it. It's a tradition. The commander in chief can come by to any unit and do a review if he wants to. A officer can do a review of any unit if he or she decides to. And Lincoln wanted to see what the status of the forces were. And he's not really a military service member. He has no experience in it. He's never gone to a school. He's never been a cadet. He has no clue really what he's looking at. But what he's trying to do is he's trying to bring the morale up to, of the troops to show them that he's in the field with them, that he's there in the fight, even if he's not physically on the ground with them. A lot of presidents do that. As he's out here, um, there's a little boy who's playing the drums for this review. He's 11 years old, and he's rapping away at his drum set. Now, he's extremely proud of that drum set. He's had that drum set with him throughout the entirety of the Seven Days Battles. Now, I have a kid at the house that's almost that age. I can't imagine my kid standing at Malvern Hill with a drum set, beating away and having the fortitude to continue to wrap those drums and not turn around and run the other direction. Most kids that age uh, probably would not have the bravery to stand at the face of death like that and just continue to do their duty. But this young boy did. As a result, in 1863, Willie Johnson would end up being the youngest recipient of the Medal of Honor for his bravery in the face of the enemy during the Seven Days Battles. Unfortunately, though, fast forward to 1941, it's speculated that Johnson dies of old age and is one of the last surviving veterans of the Seven Days Battles. They know that he died right around that time, but they have no idea where he died. They have no idea where he's buried. And to this day, it's a mystery where the youngest recipient of the Medal of Honor is buried. Oddly enough, he never even applied for a pension. Now, when George B. McClellan came barreling back down the river to this location, he wasn't running, per se, because his army had just had a victory. Um, for all intents and purposes, the, the army itself had won fight after fight. It had done what it was supposed to do. Even though those fights were hard fought and at some points seemed like victory was not going to happen. But they did exactly as they were supposed to do. Still, they got on ships, they sailed back down the river, and they redeployed here. Now, 
According to McClellan, he was setting up a new base, which is controversial. A lot of people like to say he wasn't setting up a new base, he was retreating. And that's not just rebels that were saying that. Northern soldiers in his own camp would write about that and talk about how they didn't feel like they should be retreating in the face of the enemy. Newspapers depicted him during his campaign for presidency as sitting on a turret on a ship, staring at the soldiers at Malvern Hill as they fought, essentially making him out to be a coward. Reality is, he was a general with very, very complicated ways of thinking, and he wasn't a coward by any means. He just did not want to continue to fight in the position that he was in. And his intelligence was telling him that the army that was facing him was a lot larger than what it really was. So, with that intelligence, he thought if he redeployed his men here and set up a new base, that he could get them back up to full strength and fight in another location, which is essentially what he tried to do. Really, you can't get any more beautiful than this. It's the countryside out here in Virginia by the James River. This is a magnificent property. It still is today. And the amount of history here is kind of, it, it's overwhelming. There's a lot that's happened here and there's absolutely no way to cover everything. Now, if you're interested in seeing the monument that was placed in honor of Willie Johnson, the drummer boy, it's out here next to the Taps Monument. You just have to walk out a little way. And it is right there on the ground, facing that river. I'm in the Harrison Cemetery right now. And I don't know if you can see it or not. That monument right there was one that was placed by um, the children of William Harrison. And on that monument, it says it was put, put, put here in 1859 in dedication to their father, which is a very touching and moving thing. But if you consider the time period that that was placed here, this river, 1859. In just a couple of years, this hillside is going to see thousands of soldiers trudging up this hillside in an American Civil War, something that many people, in, even in 1859, didn't think was possible. But it came to be possible because people would start a civil war. As a veteran, when you hear taps played today, you're not thinking of bedtime. You're thinking of the soldiers, sailors, and marines, and airmen that are lost to conflict. Because now, taps is played at the funerals of those that died in those conflicts. It is likely, here on these grounds where I'm standing right now, taps for the very first time would be whistled by Dan Butterfield. Now, Dan Butterfield changed the tune from Tattoo to turn it into that lullaby in the evening when the lights were to go out. And he changed it to the tune that we know as Taps. Out here on this field directly behind me would have been where he was headquartered. 
and he was out here with Oliver Norton, I believe it is, which is also a thing of contention too. But he's out here with him, and that soldier for the first time picks up his bugle, and he blasts those notes for the very first time. Now inside this building here, um, the historian took me into the basement and showed me the actual bugle that was used to play those notes for the very first time. I'd have to say that's one of the most inspiring things that I've been able to see here in Virginia. There's not too many things that gives you chills like that. I've been to the Smithsonian and seen the Star Spangled Banner that flew over Fort McHenry. That gave me chills. But to see that bugle that played those notes for the first time, you think about all those men, all those women, all those service members that have served the armed forces. And you think about the ones that we lost. That tune's the only thing that's there to comfort their family with that flag when they're brought home. This beautiful scenery here behind me at one point in time was interrupted by the sounds of taps. Out here in these fields is where I'm talking about. This is where it was played for the first time. And it could be heard all the way across the James River, which is there directly behind me. And the Confederate soldiers on the other side heard that tune for the first time. And they all began to play it. It was said that soldiers all the way up and down the line that had bugles heard that note and would come in here and they would ask Mr. Norton how to play that tune. It was a haunting melody, and it's still haunting today. If that doesn't put a lump in your throat, I don't know what will. Standing here in this location, they have a button you can press and it tells a story about taps. But unexpectedly at the end, they play taps. And in this location, that tune echoes and reverberates throughout this land, all across these fields. The wind almost seemed to pick up at the exact moment that the tune was played. These fields, like many other fields, they seem to speak to me. If you come out to Berkeley, it's going to speak to you too. So what happens after Berkeley? After all the waiting and after all the anticipation? Well, some of the forces get sent up north to Centerville to go fight with John Pope. That of course turns into a disaster. Then you have the fight 
the campaign of uh, Second Manassas, which is another disaster for the Union Army. And the bee goes on and on and on with death after death, fight after fight, until finally it's over in 1865. I feel very fortunate to be able to come out here and have this historian walk me around and give me some of the highlights here at Berkeley Plantation. Now, it's somewhere out here in this location where I'm at right now. You can't really tell because of the bushes that are out here. But according to the historian out here, George B. McClellan would have made his headquarters right here in this field, which is not too far from the house, which is right there. Now, you'd be wondering, well, why not the house? He was a little Napoleon after all, and uh, he was known for taking up large mansions for his headquarters. Well. Unfortunately, that large mansion, which was in disrepair, became part of the signal tower and was also a field hospital. There wasn't much they could do for some of those soldiers that were brought here, but they would bring them inside there and work on them. Out here in these fields, directly to my left, that way, there were tents that were put up also because there wasn't enough, there, were, there weren't enough dwellings around here to make into hospitals. So. They created hospitals from tents, and these soldiers that were suffering were actually out here in July and August in the sweltering heat, suffering. Um, and I, I suppose it probably wasn't a cold snap like there has been the last few days here in Virginia. Um, you can imagine 90 something degrees, 90 plus percent humidity, and then came malaria. Malaria became the prevalent thing out here at these, at these field hospitals. And that letter that she read talked about sunken eyes and the, the sickly men that were raising their heads up from their beds inside the tents. That was the sickness of the day at this camp. They were dealing with a massive influx of people becoming ill with malaria. And then of course there were other things like dysentery and uh, the flu, pneumonia. Many people died here as a result of sickness versus a result of a scar or wound of some sort from a battle. you've enjoyed this video as much as I've enjoyed being here and seeing this place for the very first time. I've never actually been to Berkeley before and when Tammy and her husband got on X and contacted me and told me about this place and then actually gave me the shocking news that they had it approved for me to come out here and, and actually uh, film the grounds. Not only was I honored to come out here but I was pleased and overjoyed reading up on the history, knowing what all took place here. Um, so I hope you took a lot from this video, and I hope that you actually come out here, if you go to anywhere in Virginia, out here at the Berkeley Plantation, see this place for yourself. Until next time, history of Columbus.